Sarabja, so, you were first in the chat. Hello. To anybody that's joining Brain Tech Support Lab for the first time, uh, what we do here is explore how to have a human brain with lots of human experiences while uh, living our lives, while doing the things we want to do and letting the brain throw up whatever it wants to throw up. So if you have any questions, uh, if you have any uh, goals you're working towards, any values you've been practicing lately, let's talk about them. Uh, especially since it's, you know, probably Sunday where you are. I think it's Sunday for everybody now. Uh, I've been time traveling again. Um, and so if it's, uh, yeah, Sunday for you, we're kind of getting into the start of a week. Uh, the start of a week in a world where a lot of difficult things are happening. Uh, so it's useful to talk about, yeah, how we navigate that. And that's what we'll do here today. For uh, me, I'm, you know, very briefly, I've been uh, stopping by uh, Tokyo this week. And uh, I went for a walk today in Ueno Park, Ueno Park. Uh, and uh, yeah, mostly because it's a, it's a really nice park. There's always so much going on in the park. And today I wanted to go to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Tokyo Metropolitan Museum of Art, because there was a calligraphy exhibit happening there. Uh, when I, years ago when I was a teacher in Japan, I would take calligraphy lessons. I would kind of ride my bike. I was out in the countryside. I would ride through the, the town and the fields to a community center where I would do calligraphy lessons. Uh, and I find calligraphy is a really fascinating art form because you both look at it. It's about how it looks visually, uh, but then also the meanings we attach to the words uh, that are being written there. So it's both the, the style expresses something, the shape and the form and the positioning and the white space, and, you know, how the ink is used, even like how much, how watery the ink is, how thick the ink is. That's all part of the meaning. Uh, and then there's also the meaning we attach to it. So it's a lot like our experiences in life and our experiences in our heads. Ugbad, I'm good. How are you? Graham, it's good to see you. Things are going well over here. I hope you're doing well. Luna the Grey said, do you have advice for navigating a breakup where doubt that it is the right decision keeps creeping in? If we want to get certainty uh, about something, um, and really most somethings, pretty much anything, uh, we are going to doubt it. And so I'd, I'd just be curious there, are you? Because when you present the fact that doubt creeps, keeps creeping in as a problem, are you putting pressure on yourself to have certainty about this? Uh, and just being open to the possibility that, that that might just be an extra impossible thing. So on top of the difficult feelings that come up with a breakup, are you also expecting yourself to have certainty about uh, exploring life and making choices? And that could be adding an extra heavy, uh, difficult expectation on top of a situation that's already difficult. Srabja, I see. Oh, I see. You said hello again. Did you did you say drop by to say hello and then leave and then return? Hello to you again. Welcome back. I think building off of what we were just discussing there with Luna the Grey on expecting certainty during a breakup, but we can expand that as the pattern that comes up quite consistently for many struggles and just that we put an expectation on ourselves to be having an experience that we're not having and that creates a lot of difficulty i think if you're having 
physical sensations in your body and like this feeling shouldn't be here there should be some other right perfect correct feeling but you're not having that feeling you're having a different feeling so then placing that expectation to be having a reality that you're not having uh, it's just always going to cause a lot of stress the last raptor good morning it's good to see you i hope your day is going well Graham sits here, I'm doing very well. It seems surreal after all the work I put in through ERP that I'm no longer suffering intensely. Hey, Graham, congratulations on you know, taking yourself on this journey and bringing on these skills. Uh, yeah, you put it into practice. Uh, so enjoy continuing that. These are skills you have now. This is awareness you have now. And you'll get to use it and practice it. So, yeah, that's great to hear. Oh, Mud369, yes. Is this an airplane? No, it is not an airplane. It's a very, un, it's, a, it's a hotel lounge with very uncomfortable seating. Actually, I took a bunch of pillows from the seat over here and I jammed them in the chair behind me here, but it's still, it's still very uncomfortable. <laughs> Okay, you thought was, I guess this kind of looks like some of the lights they have on the, especially like the Dreamliner planes. It would be great if um, a uh, plane had books, but I can see how it would be a turbulence hazard. If there were, if there were big books over everybody's head. It would be nice if they handed that out, right? Instead of having like entertainment systems and stuff like that, uh, they just gave people a book when they got on. But I suppose the weight, the extra weight might be an issue. But if, if they told people they can't take luggage, we're just going to give you a book because the book contains so many heavy ideas. I'd be okay with that. Not a fan of luggage. So wrap it up. So do you think if lack of sleep, overconsumption of caffeine, not so active lifestyle, and overthinking and overacting are interconnected. How to sleep better if you're having a rough day and intrusive thoughts and urge to do compulsions. So to the first question, uh, so lack of sleep, overconsumption of caffeine, a not active lifestyle and overthinking and overreacting, are they interconnected? Uh, I, I would, so I, I wouldn't necessarily say, oh, those are interconnected in that they, they're all somehow uh, causing one another or uh, responsible for one another. I, w I would say that all makes sense though. Uh, if we're taking a kind of reactive controlling approach to one thing, we're probably taking that same approach to many things. Uh, if we're doing a lot of overthinking, um, we're probably applying that practice in many, many different places. So I also wouldn't look at it as multiple things to tackle. I, I look at what you described there as one thing. Like if somebody is taking an unhelpful approach to experiences, everything you described there makes sense because they're probably applying that approach in many, many different areas. So then it's how to sleep better if you're having a rough day. Uh, so I, I'd be curious about why having a rough day gets in the way of sleeping. And there you're probably going to find some compulsions. Right? Like why, why does a rough day mean you can't sleep well? Uh, and by exploring that question, that's where you'll probably see the things to change. Utsev, is how often do I meditate and how significantly has it helped you? The, so I, there's a couple of things I'd watch out here for here. The, so one, the kind of like, how often do you meditate? And then the second question, how has it helped you? Uh, like the frequency of me meditating isn't a useful data point. And so if you're thinking that 
uh, oh, like what's the kind of like what's the right amount to meditate or something like that. That can get you into a lot of uh, struggle. And uh, so sometimes I participate in meditation communities, and a very common question that will come up: someone will, oh, I'm like, ah, I've been I've been meditating for three years. I meditate. Uh, 10 minutes every single day, twice a day, uh, it's done nothing for me. Uh, and then, but then if you talk to the person about what they're doing and describing as meditation, uh, they, ha they haven't necessarily started to meditate yet. Um, but they have, they have been sitting uh, or, you know, and maybe doing a lot of thinking uh, for, you know, 10 minutes, twice a day. Uh, that's the practice can be more useful to look at than getting caught up in some kind of right amounts of time. So I'd say that'd be one warning to watch out for. Because uh, somebody who's going to uh, sit down and practice uh, ruminating uh, and checking and controlling thoughts uh, for a period of time uh, is going to yeah is going to get uh, better at that, um, and that's okay too. We can notice when we're we're doing those kinds of things, uh, but yeah, if you want to explore meditation, um, really be exploring the practice of like what are you going to do when you sit down there, rather than getting caught up in like oh, I did this thing ten minutes a day for seven days of the week. So that'd be one thing. And then the other thing on the, um, the question of has it helped you? I would say meditation, I would approach meditation and mindfulness much more as the quality of awareness that arises from cutting out all of the compulsions and unhelpful things we've been doing. So I, and, and very much that was my experience too. I, I, came to meditation as a way to practice the, the skills that I'd learned rather than a thing to like help with something. It was something I started exploring more after learning how to cut out uh, compulsions outside of my head and inside of my head. And then noticing, oh, meditation is describing this practice of cutting out all of the checking and controlling and time traveling that we like to do in our heads. So rather than seeing meditation as a thing that should help you, I'd say uh, you can help meditation. Yeah, you can drop um, a lot of unhelpful practices and then um, that can be really useful for meditating. Super committee. Super committee. Maybe if you could describe. I'm not sure I understand if you're asking a question there. But you mentioned picking on yourself a lot, and that doesn't sound useful. You don't have to pick on yourself. It can be really useful to be kind to ourselves. Rizzy said, when I go to class, I often start crying because of the panic that arises because of it. And I obviously can't stay in there disturbing the class with it. How could you overcome this? The, so I'd, I'd be curious. So Rizzy, I, I wouldn't necessarily start by looking at the, the class or the panic or, around class and the crying there. Uh, I'd be really curious about where this starts. And so, yeah, if you can connect with a, you know, a professional or, yeah, if you're in school, if there's like a counselor or something like that, uh, exploring, like, what's all of the stuff, all of the controlling and judging that happens before uh, the panic starts? Uh, that's, what I, that's what I'd be curious about. Uh, rather than, you know, going through all of that and... and having that difficult experience and then looking for a way to kind of fix it. Um, yeah, well, there were probably some fears and, and sensitive emotions there that it could be useful to explore with someone.
Erica, I sat at a big social event last night and found myself replaying the tapes a bit afterwards, thinking of all the things I could have said or should have done better. How do I not do that? Uh, so one, it goes really natural, uh, especially like if we do something that's a bit unusual. You can see like we care about other people. So if we do a social event that's a bit unusual, that's a, maybe a bit bigger, or we took on more responsibility or something than usual, uh, expect the brain to kind of be sore afterwards. So it's very much like doing a, a big uh, physical fitness workout. Uh, we did something a little bigger than usual. Body, the body is going to be sore. Same with the brain. We do something that's like pushes on our mental fitness a little more than usual. Brain's going to be sore. One of the ways it's often will express that is like, oh, I want to repeat something. Uh, and so it's going to want to replay the tapes. And so what I find useful to do in a scenario like that, uh, it's the one expected. So I'll, I'll often now maybe plan something in for the day after something uh, kind of big, because in the past I would think, oh no, I've got to, like I've got to rest after or something like that. But actually then my brain doesn't have a way to kind of ramp down. So it's, it's too abrupt because there was lots of thinking uh, and planning leading up to the event, and now suddenly there's nothing. So the brain's like, ah, okay, let's, let's ruminate on it. Um, so I'll plan something as a ramp down. Uh, but then when the brain throws up, it, could, it, like it wants to replay the tapes or something, uh, I'll, I'll just notice whatever I'm thinking about, like, oh, I could have said something better to that person. Uh, but instead, uh, just like, wow, yeah, like, I, it's really great I had that event last night because that person is never going to talk to me again. So I'm really glad I got to enjoy that time with them. Or in fact, none of the people who came to the event, I'm ever going to see them again. Uh, so I really, I really appreciate that we had the chance to spend time together. Mm -hmm. So yeah, whatever the brain is trying to control, I would just take it there immediately. Uh, that, yep, we lost it, it's gone. Uh, and so let's get back to uh, doing what we want to do today now that we have no friends. Mm -hmm. Pom Pom Kitty, I hope you're doing well too. KCP, hello, thanks for dropping by. And Vegan Knowledge, hello. Hi Sarah. Frogmancer, you said, I recently realized that despite how much hate how much I hate feeling bad. It feels like something is missing when I'm not. Like I associate needing help and coddling with love and safety. It's interesting, really useful to see. Across the board, I would say one of the most challenging pro skills is letting things go well. Because also we've come to see, you know, in many ways, we may see having problems as a way that we receive safety, we receive comfort. Having a problem might be a way we approach having control, right? That we think, oh, I can only have control if I'm fixing a problem. We might do it with happiness. We only know how to be happy by solving something bad. So then we always need something bad so we can solve it. Uh, and so kicking out that old engine, building a new engine that's about just growing and adding the things we want to see in the world is a really useful step, but it is really challenging. So yeah, it's great you're noticing that. Zentai said, how true is it that the nervous system takes some time to catch up with our changes? For example, I feel like I significantly reduced rumination for a week, yet physically not much relief. Oh, wow. So a week isn't even, uh, when I talk about the nervous system taking time to catch up, uh, a week I wouldn't even see as a, like a time period of of significant length. Uh, so it is great, right? It is wonderful to reduce ruminating for a week. Uh, but reducing ruminating is a like a useful, enjoyable thing all onto itself. Like congr congratulations for reducing ruminating uh, for a week. Uh, enjoy two weeks and three weeks and four weeks and five months and six years. Uh, wonderful, wonderful that you, we don't have to do all of that extra work in our heads. Uh, but mental fitness and physical fitness, very similar. Uh, we're not, I wouldn't 
put pressure on to expect some kind of change uh, after a week. But also, uh, the reason I'm hesitating here, because also it sounds like the change you're looking for is relief. Um, and I'm, yeah, I'm not sure what you would mean by that. If you're looking at reducing ruminating as a kind of ritual to get rid of some other feeling or something like that, um, that I, I wouldn't see that approach as useful. Uh, so yeah, there's a couple things maybe to explore there. But cutting out ruminating um, or reducing it significantly, that's fantastic. Like, enjoy that. Okay, says there were new people at the event, and I think one of them is so cool and interesting. So yes, I'm grateful I got to see them for the last time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's great you got to meet them. You got to invite that super cool person to that event. That's a, even like such a cool experience. They were there briefly, and now they're gone. Kimberly, good morning. Thank you so much for the donation. Thanks for joining us this morning. I appreciate it. I hope you're having a good morning. Vegan knowledge it said, it's interesting how I can be okay and feel like I got this. And then the next moment my anxiety is high and I'm doing a compulsion or avoiding a normal task. This is the hardest thing to overcome. So one thing that really helped me is approaching mental health as a practice, not a point. So even, and this is always something kind of to watch out for. If you ever notice the brain going, oh, like, we got this. Or like, yeah, this, like, I know this, this is solved. That, that's often the thing that will proceed as not godding it. Uh, and things kind of falling apart a bit. Instead, it helped me to approach it as a thing. I never, I never have to get it. Uh, as like a, oh, like it's a, a done thing or a completed thing. It's that in this next moment, I'll have the opportunity to make a choice. And I'm going to look at the context of this situation, this con the context of where I'm at, and I'm going to choose to give my time and energy to something I care about. And then in the moment after that, I'm going to have the exact same choice again. And it's not, it's not a kind of a thing I have to get. It's always going to be an opportunity to practice. Um, that kind of newness that we can approach each moment can be really supportive. Because uh, then, yeah, we're not getting just kind of lost in some old habit. Uh, we can really make a choice, an active choice in that moment. Oh, and then vegan knowledge, I see say there too, I'm feeling a lot of improvement though. Um, so thank you for the work you put in to help everyone. Hey, I'm glad, I'm glad it's helping with your adventuring. Ah, Zentai, yes. Enjoy, enjoy not needing to get rid of the, uh, the physical symptoms of anxiety. Polly, hello, thanks for coming by. Frogmancer said, how to balance learning to not trust any chatter or random fears my brain throws up, yet trusting my judgment and reasoning on things that matter. I, I look to objective data points uh, and processes for making decisions. So having having ways that I decide how to decide 
rather than uh, getting caught up in uh, like trying to have like categories like, as though, okay, in these scenarios, I'm going to trust the stuff in my head. And then in these scenarios, I don't trust the stuff in my head. Uh, so really finding ways to make decisions that uh, yeah, are, more, are more objective and helpful to me. Joy Panzer, welcome, welcome to the live stream. Thanks for dropping by the chat. Uh, he said, I hope everyone's been having feelings. I hope they have been. I hope you've been having feelings. Oh, and yeah, you can see, yeah, you can hear, we have, we have kind of classic contemporary hotel lounge music. Joel, I hope you've been doing great too. He said, I've been trying to not give in to compulsions when I get intrusive thoughts, but they're so awful, it's really hard to let them go and realize they won't happen, but I'm doing better. And so it's great you're doing better. The one thing I'd add to what you described is that if we're trying to realize they won't happen, then we're just trying to get reassurance. And of course, the brain will always be able to think of reasons they could happen. Uh, if you're trying to avoid that, um, that can create a lot of stress and struggle. Um, what if that wasn't a goal you were pursuing? Oh, and yeah, so Jerome, yeah, he said, I'm having an OC, an ROCD flare up, and I don't know if I'm going against my intuition or gut feeling. How do I know if my gut is true? I don't want to leave, but my stomach knots have, haven't gone away. So I, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't have an answer for you on approaching things like intuition or gut feeling because I, I wouldn't find those helpful. Uh, my gut always wanted to practice the compulsions. My intuition was always to do the compulsion. Uh, so it helped me to, you know, look at frameworks like using values to make decisions uh, because quite often uh, the thing that I would be anxious about was the thing that was most useful to me. And then I would avoid the thing I was anxious about and then I would get upset about not taking a path in life that was useful to me. But I was always choosing to avoid the things that were useful to me. Uh, at the same time, of course, there's all sorts of things um, that aren't useful to us and might make us anxious. So I find just using uh, like gut feeling, intuition, any kind of feeling, it doesn't matter if it's your gut feeling or your foot feeling or your ear feeling, your brain feeling, uh, whatever feeling, I would look at finding a more useful framework that's not based on brain and digestion. Rugosa, thank you for dropping by this space. I'm glad you could be here. Arya, that's good to hear you're doing so much better. He said, I realized that I'm not scared of my thoughts, but I'm scared that I'll keep thinking these thoughts every day, trying not to judge the thoughts. Yeah, could you welcome the thoughts? Could you invite the thoughts to visit your hotel lounge and sit down with you? Maybe give them a, a comfortable seat beside you. SW said, so that feeling of not feeling right, what is it? It is a compulsion to judge feelings as right or wrong. I think like a contamination. It's the compulsion to go, ooh, this feels contaminated. This is wrong. It shouldn't be here. I need to clean it. Polyus said, I'm on the OCD recovery path. My wife and my family are kind of pressuring us to have a baby. I'm not sure if I'd be able to take care of my wife and my child since I'm spending so much time taking care of myself. Thoughts. I'd be curious, uh, like I'd have a lot of questions. 
So I don't. I, I I'm not going to give you a, like a, a suggestion either way on having a baby. Of course, that's a, a something for for you to explore. But I'd be curious about how taking care of yourself would be interfering with uh, family and the people you care about. Because I, I, I would see those, you know, working with a lot of people who have families and babies and, and relationships, etc. cetera, uh, taking care of you and taking care of your relationships, those are things that go together. They're not separate. Um, and so, yeah, I would just say that. Um, so I'd be curious about what the statements you made mean to you. And are there other possible ways of approaching uh, care for yourself? Joy Panzer said, I've been having a health anxiety spike lately. Though some genuine health issues have popped up. I started Googling the symptoms to find someone with the same symptoms as me. I even notice the urge in the moment is like, but what if? Oh, but I just need to. Oh, but if I just get an answer, is it important to catch the urge and just welcome it and take no action? I mean, it would be really useful. And but you don't you don't have to take my word for it. You can just you can experiment with it. The, what if what if there is something that would be more beneficial to your health than doing some Googling? Uh, what are those other things you'd like to be exploring? What would you like to give yourself right now uh, as a yeah, practice of support and care? Because if, yeah, if you're running into some health issues, what would be caring to you if you were taking care of you? So I think if you were like in a hospital bed, would you want somebody, you're, you're kind of a uh, nurse to come in and sit down with a laptop? Okay, your treatment for today is we're going to Google for five hours. Let's find out what, what weird and odd things we can find. Maybe we'll find nobody with the exact same symptoms as you. Let's go. Uh, not, right, probably not the most supportive treatment plan. So I'd be curious about why, why that seems like an appealing treatment plan. Uh, could there be other options? KCP said, I have a question about fatigue and rest. Rest is something I very much need at times, but I often get stuck laying down, waiting until I feel right before I do things. How do I find a good balance? It, it, with rest, it can really be beneficial to, to explore how do we proactively incorporate rest uh, and plan it in rather than, so you, rather than waiting until there's like a wrong feeling and we're like, oh, I really need to rest but also waiting until there's like a right feeling for both, whether it's rest or it's work. Like, oh, I've got to get this kind of right feeling before I start something, or, oh, I've, I've got this wrong feeling, I've got to stop. That framework in general is, is really useful to detach from and start to look at, you know, based on how you work, what helps you thrive. What would be a framework uh, for proactive rest, proactive creative time, proactive intense work time that you can implement that'll just help you thrive. Uh, because it's okay for us to not even get to a point where we realize we need rest because we're taking care of ourselves. Uh, or not even need to get to a point where like, oh, I've really got to do a bunch of work right now because we've been proactively doing that work um, and stepping into those challenges. So kind of what's that schedule that'll really help you thrive? Masha, good morning. 
I said, I've been lying in bed and ruminating well after my alarm goes off because it's cold. I need a better morning routine, but I'm having trouble building one. Oh, I thought, Zamasha, do you have a question about that? Or are you just noticing you're having trouble building one? Because that's okay to notice we're having trouble building one. If you want to do something different, what would help you do something differently in the mornings? Yeah, Joe Panzer. Like you notice here, you say, what's funny is all of the health issues I have are inflamed by stress. And by checking, I'm increasing stress. So I do need a better treatment plan. Yeah, that's exactly why we look at it. Because we're like, oh, there's a problem here. Okay, I'm going I'm gonna to like add to the problem by making myself stress. Uh, yeah, the compo- I see, like health anxiety is fascinating because it's the, the one anxiety where we will practice doing something we know is unhealthy for us, the compulsions but as a reaction only to the possibility of something unhealthy. Uh, So it is it is like chopping off our heads because we're like, ooh, because I might get a brain eating amoeba. So I I got rid of my brain, like a doing the compulsions as a reaction to a fear uh, is yeah, guaranteed to create a health problem uh, where there was only the fear of a health problem. Arya said, I've noticed that my OCD spikes up when I'm traveling alone somewhere. Any way to get over this anxiety of being alone? Uh, so it can be really fun to, to be alone uh, and explore that and, and make that okay. There, there might be anxiety there. Instead of seeing it as a thing to get rid of, could you, you know, next time you're traveling alone, uh, be curious about it? What is the brain trying to control in that moment? What are the uncertainties that we might very naturally be anxious about? What if, what if, yeah, the anxiety isn't a problem at all, uh, but it's something to expect? What if it's something that actually tells us we're going in a direction that's useful to us? What if the anxiety is a different feeling, but we're so accustomed to only you know, reacting to problems, only having anxiety to fix, that any heightened feeling just immediately gets interpreted and translated to anxiety. What if it's excitement? What if it's just uncertainty? About like, wow, there's so much uncertain here, uncertain here around me. I don't know what's going to happen. Ah, and then it becomes anxiety. So yeah. It'd be fun to do some uh, solo moving around and just be curious about what comes up. Skedad said, how do I cut out compulsions without making it a contamination or about getting rid of or avoiding anxiety and OCD? What helpful value does it align with? Ah, so actually that last question there is the one you could ask yourself. Like that is showing the way to make it not about cleaning something. Uh, It's identifying that thing we want to do. What do we want to grow and build? And then we look at how do I do that well? And then we put our time and energy behind building that rather than trying to avoid and get rid of something. That's what helps us make it about building and growing. Bagel, bagel, you're resting now. <laughs> Enjoy the rest. <laughs> but I, I hope, I hope you can have a restful time sitting with the live stream today. Uh, and then Skedad, yeah, you said could journaling or writing down reminders be helpful to not relapse? I, it could be. Um, they, they, also, it doesn't have to be about preventing relapse. Uh, journaling or writing could be useful on their own, right? For whatever it is you would like to explore. Uh, but the, the way to find out with all of these 
skills and techniques. Like, they are all about practice. The, the way to explore anything here is to try something, uh, is to not take it as like, oh, uh, you know, somebody said on a YouTube video, Mark said on a live stream, whatever, therefore, uh, no, like it, it's about you taking concepts, applying them in your own life and seeing how they help you move in a direction you want to go. Um, if they don't take you in a direction where you want to go, uh, if they don't uh, serve you in whatever it is you want to do, then you can find other things you want to do and practice and try those. Yeah, so as Bagel 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 was saying here, it may be easier to orient yourself towards something you want to do rather than moving away from an undesired thing like relapse. Yeah, so journaling is great. How would you write about your day? Would you journal about all of the dogs you met that day? That's a great thing to journal about. <laughs> John, hello? Yeah, I think with any kind of, um, and this, this goes to what we were talking about earlier with meditation. Because uh, this will, you know, these kind of questions will come up a lot like, oh, will meditation work? Will journaling work? Uh, and what we're doing in that moment is we're looking for this, this outside thing to be some kind of ritual that's going to change something that. I mean, we need to change. And so the, yeah, the looking at those tools, not as a thing to like fix something, but as a way to express ourselves, as a way to practice being ourselves, um, as something we can do because we've dropped all that unhelpful stuff we were doing. Uh, so more as a, again, like an opportunity. So because I'm not doing all of these uh, compulsions, all of this checking and controlling in my head, I'm going to take some time to write about all the dogs I met today. Uh, rather than like, oh, I've got to write about all of the dogs I met today because it's going to fix something in my head. Uh, yeah, then it's, prob it's probably not going to. <laughs> Model, absolutely, we can have a dance break. Please, please have dancing. Some people can lie down and rest. Other people can dance. Yeah, it's a very open, open concept lounge. Uh, and this relates to. So I see Erica. Your question here: Do you ever go to any of the Japanese introvert restaurants? I've seen in videos the ones where you don't have to talk to anyone, and you get a private little booth to eat in. So it's it's really interesting. Uh, because I wouldn't, I wouldn't have thought of those as introvert restaurants. Those are just like how most, uh, not most, but a very large proportion of Japanese restaurants are set up that way. Like Japan, it's it's been very common to there's there's a you know a set of restaurants or there's that have always existed. Um, we probably say like you know, from the, yeah, for a very long time, uh, that were set up for people eating alone. Uh, often, you know, like coming back from work, um, you and not only eating alone, but they might be standing up. Uh, so that, that experience in a restaurant isn't, isn't uh, strange at all. Um, and it's, it's not that, different like there's a lot of places in the world where you'll you'll see that like one of the ones that springs to mind is what you'll often see in mexico especially with taco stands um and like other like tacos tostadas sopes like at the at the end of the day around the end of the workday, you often see a lot of people standing around 
uh, the taco stand, like grabbing a taco on the, on the way home, for instance. And yeah, like there might be some people talking, but a lot of people, they're not, they're not there to talk. They're there to like, I'm, I'm going to grab some food on my own. And so, yeah, it's not boxed off. Um, but it's the same kind of concept. And actually, in, in many Japanese restaurants, you wouldn't, like a lot of, say, near where I am, actually, by Ueno train station, there are a lot of small restaurants that are standing only, and they're, they're quite narrow. And yeah, you would go in, you're going to order, you're going to eat your food, you're going to leave. You're not, you're, you might be like right beside somebody else. So not necessarily <laughs> introverted in the sense you would be uh, in a booth, but nobody would be talking to each other. Uh, really, really common. One of my favorite restaurants uh, was in Osaka. So in the kind of north of Osaka, north of Umeda, there's a curry restaurant where there are synthesizers attached to plants and the plants make music and you're encouraged to go there. You don't have to go alone. There are some seats for pairs of people. It's not encouraged. And <laughs> you generally go in there and you sit and there are signs up saying like, please, you know, if you have to talk, talk quietly. Uh, but it's intended that you're not, you're gonna go and you're not gonna talk and you're gonna enjoy, they only serve one thing, which is curry, like Japanese curry, and you have some different options in terms of the sauce and the toppings, but you're, you're gonna have curry and you're gonna sit there and you're gonna listen to the electronic music created by plants. And it's in this old building, which has lots of plants and it kind of, it's kind of both very contemporary art and retro art and appliances. And it's, it's really nice. The curry is also like one of the best curries, uh, Japanese curries I've ever had. And yeah, you sit there and you have your meal and you listen to the plants play music for you. It's a really good time. And so I think I, I like that in Japan, like there are restaurants like that. Uh, whereas, yeah, in a lot of places, right, there, there isn't that, that option. Uh, but yeah, if anybody, if anybody likes to uh, eat solo, uh, Japan has a lot of great options for you. Frogmenter said, building and growing seems very hard with depression making me feel so tired and hopeless. It's almost like OCD and worrying livens up my days and when that's gone, everything is just eh. But I would start to see those as connected. There, it's the thing that, yeah, it's, and it always seems this way. I, I don't know if you caught, I was talking about it earlier, like we get hooked on solving the problem and we think that, oh, like this gives me a thing to do. This livens up my day. Or like, I'm happy because I'm solving a problem. But then you see the consequence of that is that depression. And it really helps to start connecting them together. So in my book, in, in You Are Not a Rock, The Mind Workout, um, I, I describe it as a person who likes jumping in the water and hates getting wet. And you see it there perfectly. The, yeah, we'll like doing compulsions all day and then hate the crash, hate the consequences it causes, it's useful to put them together, to start to see, oh, actually, I don't like practicing compulsions all day because it's just going to make me miserable later. Frogmancer, I oh, know, you mentioned here that dog journaling is an amazing idea. I'd love to do, oh, bug journaling, but winter is coming. Yeah, you could, you could journal, though, about what the bugs do in winter. Maybe they sleep in the ground? Jerome. It is, it is a weird, intense feeling when it seems like our stomach is getting ripped out and thrown on the ground. Uh, but yeah, you see here, there are a bunch of compulsions. Right, like Googling and checking feelings. Mm, Boasting Gamer said, how do we face night sweats and heart palpitations at night, possibly from anxiety, even when we're not thinking about anxiety or anxious thoughts? Uh, I would look at the compulsions during the daytime. 
we're doing lots of compulsions during the day, the brain is just going to keep on doing what we taught it at night. Whoa, bagel, bagel, bagel. Yeah, you got a porache. The uh, people know that's the, the like, I think it, it is intended to be sandal shaped, right? It's the more like oval, uh, of the more oval of the tortilla family. <laughs> Kimberly, there are there are great restaurants here. Mm, okay, yeah, so this is culturally very different from the U.S. If someone is sitting alone eating or reading, it's almost like there's a sign over their head saying, please talk to me. Yeah, it would, it would in, in a bunch of places, um, it would be kind of seen as like, in, yeah, inappropriate. Uh, here in Japan to be talking, um, which is, but this is why an interesting thing happened during the pandemic, like, and yeah, the pandemic still going on, uh, but like at the height of it, a lot of signs went up in Japan to discourage talking. Because uh, this was kind of in the early days of things. Uh, the, the signs have stayed up. Uh, like you'll still see them around uh, that like oh like don't don't talk out loud as though like you're going to you're going to like <laughs> spit uh, spit viruses all over the place uh, but yeah you'll I'll still see a bunch of um, like uh, you know like you'll see like a sign that'll be like wash your hands and stay two meters apart and don't talk to people <laughs> so that but I think I think Part of that is, uh, yeah, it's, it's not about, um, it's, it's kind of, so people are just taking advantage of that because <laughs> they'd rather have uh, some places be quiet. Um, and so they're, uh, yeah, it's not, it's not really necessarily about um, public health at this point. SW, so what kind of music do plants make? They make beautiful music, as plants would. Bagel, bagel, bagel. So when I first moved to the city early last year, I would strike up conversations with anyone sitting alone or standing in line at the restaurants I went to. Is <laughs> my golden retriever personality goals? <laughs> Yeah, Frogmancer said, the personal space bubble in my country is so huge. It's like a mortal sin to sit near someone in an empty bus or restaurant or start up any conversation. Yeah, it's, it, and it's fascinating right, in, in different places in the world how the, the personal bubble is construed. Because here in Japan, it wouldn't be... Your, your personal bubble is not seen as infringed upon if somebody's right next to you. Uh, like even, you know, I went to a ramen restaurant the other night, I arrived in Japan, this is, yeah, just after I arrived, I was like, okay, I gotta, been traveling all day, like we should have some soup and noodles and things like that. And so I went to a ramen restaurant, there was a lineup outside, um, very common to have restaurants here with lineups uh, in Tokyo. Uh, you see lineups all the time, a restaurant is going to be packed if it's good. And yeah, then in the ramen restaurant, like everybody is seated touching each other. No one's going to talk to each other. That, but it's, it's, yeah, and that's really common, like even just thinking about like even the baths. Like I was at uh, uh, a sento, which is like a, an onsen, but without, it's just like hot water versus geothermal hot water uh, the other day. And the, there's signs up there too about like no, like no loud talking. Uh, but basically no one's talking. Uh, but I think there it was like quite crowded. But again, it's not kind of, you know, like, it's quite crowded and everybody's naked. It's not seen as kind of infringing on the personal bubble. But if you talk to somebody, that would be breaking through the bubble. So the, bu the yeah, the, in that scenario, it's quite common. Yeah, the personal bubble is intact as long as there's no uh, interaction. 
so it's not strange, like sit right beside somebody. Because as long as you don't talk to them, it's like, it's like you're not even there. In winter, Sid, I've done rituals that I consider immoral, but I still do it because of the irresistible OCD urge. Now I started treatment, but those things I've done all the, all this time with OCD feels bad. What can I do? Why do you have to do something? Also, you described it as the irresistible OCD urge. What if it's not irresistible? And this is a great opportunity. You can see the brain going, yeah, we gotta do something. Be like, oh, I don't have to do something. Fabio said, recovery itself can be surrounded by compulsions. Often people focus on recovery in the future as some perfect moment without pain. But isn't it possible to recover in the present by just living? Mm, yeah, I would say we can only, like, it's not useful to, like, be going after some special recovery thing. I'd say that, like, we can ditch the whole concept of recovery. There's just this moment, and in this moment we get to make choices. And that's all. Oh, Fabio, you continue. So, I mean, living is the goal, and life will always bring some pain. It is inevitable. But is it more useful to learn how to experience it? Yeah, absolutely. John said, I'm diagnosed with OCD. I've been recently prescribed Latuda for depression. However, my fear of this drug being used for schizophrenia and bipolar has caused me to go into an anxious spiral. Ah. And then, yeah, I see Erica pointed out, yeah, it helps if you ask a, yeah, a question. Yeah, because I don't, did you have a question about that, John? Karsten. Oh, so what do I do about simulation theory, solipsism OCD? I feel like it's ruining my life, and I can't focus on giving to others or being present in the real world when OCD tells me nothing is real. Uh, so it is a compulsion like any other. Uh, so... There's a, there's a couple things I'd look at exploring. Uh, so one, uh, it never exists on its own. So uh, it, it could be useful to look at other things uh, where you like, so particularly with the solipsism, uh, simulation fears, I'd always ask people like, what do you like to get right uh, and certain? Also, you described a pattern there that could be really useful to look at, like where else is it coming up in life, which is that uh, something, you know, like the way you described it there is basically like things need to be real for me to give to people. So I'd look for anywhere else that pattern is coming up because that's a really common compulsion pattern. Like this needs to have a right feeling and then I can do this thing that's useful uh, for other people or for yourself. Uh, so where else does that pattern come up? That's going to be really fun to break. Uh, but yeah, the, the way you can work on cutting out the compulsions with this fear right now is, is giving more when things feel unreal. Uh, saying, yeah, we're fine, of course we live in a simulation and I'm going to give even more to this person. Of course, uh, none of this is real and I'm gonna put time and energy into building something I really care about. Um, and so that can, be really, that can be really fun to explore because the brain will feel like we're doing something wrong uh, but, of course, it's also uh, how we uh, show our brains we're just not going to play their silly little games anymore. Frogman said, seeing my improvement in the way I can sit here and talk about random interesting things as well. Not try to cram every reassurance needing question I can into one live stream to get a response. Yeah, it's a great practice. Bagel, bagel, bagel. Ah, uh, yeah. So John, bagel, bagel, bagel. Also offer to answer any questions. In winter, yeah, he said wanting to do recovery the right way imperfectly. If not, recovery might not work. How to tackle this? Well, but you also see the like if the fear is about recovery not working, uh, trying to do it in the right way and get it perfect is a pretty guaranteed way to get it wrong. 
Uh, so yeah, it can really help uh, to ditch like the like oh, I've got to recover concept. Like be recovered now. Like I, you're officially uh, graduated from recovery. You're 110 percent recovered. Uh, and so now that you're recovered, what would you like to give your time and energy to? So what would you like to be building and growing in life? And then let's look at how to do that well. Let's look at how to make a choice in the next moment that's about giving time and energy to that. And, and it could just be about that, that building and growing and practicing. So Dilociraptor is sharing a metaphor uh, that's helpful to them. They said, I'm a train on a track trying to get away from something. I can't stay on the same track and steer toward values. I have to switch to a different track to follow my values. And so something that can be interesting to explore when it comes to values, when you think about a track, is what are you going to do? So even we can think about this for the week ahead. What are you going to do that's going to lay that other track down? what's going to make it easier to switch tracks? Because yeah, so often the compulsion track is like really well-worn, has a lot of infrastructure facilitating it. Uh, and so it's easy to stay on the old track. So how are we going to build a new track? So yeah, enjoy building that new track, Dilociraptor. Okay, yes, yeah, what is solipsism? OCD, uh, solipsism, OCD, solipsism in general, and I'm, someone can look up the kind of exact definition of it, but solipsism is getting caught up in these questions of like, am I real? What is real? What is existence? Like it's a solipsism as a general term, like refers to the obsessing about reality and existence, I believe. Um, and so even, but even that it's a separate, like there was already a term for that. Like in some ways, solipsism OCD is uh, like chati or chai tea and chati. Yeah. Uh, like solipsism is, is a term we've had for a very long time to describe somebody doing a bunch of OCD compulsions around reality and existence. Uh, and then thanks to, uh, people's uh, Googling compulsions, um, it came to be known as solipsism OCD. But yeah, I would say solipsism OCD is like OCD OCD. Yeah, right. Mike pointed out down below existential OCD and solipsism, they are the same. Yeah. SW said, I think I have a problem with food that's not a well-known brand. The halo effect, I'm scared of cheap brands with some things and not others like cherry picking danger. Yeah, and SW, I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh, is it that you want to be able to uh, buy the food you want to buy? If so, yeah, you could do that. Like, uh, you can practice that. Uh, and right always we look at right how to do things well, how to do the things we value well. So if you say like, look, I, I'm going to make some food. Uh, and then you look at, okay, how am I going to make this food well? And you're like, well, one of the things I value with making this food this week is, is getting some affordable food. Okay, then I'm going to get the more affordable options. And then just practicing buying them. Uh, that's a thing you can do if you want to do that. Oh, Northwest, thank you for the kind words. I'm glad the videos have been a source of help. Thanks for stopping by today. Mike, you said I just finished your book for the second time. Oh, thanks for reading it. The first time I didn't really do the exercises and I was looking to escape OCD. The second time I took a much different approach. That's fantastic, Mike. Yeah, it really is. Uh, meant as a thing to do. Uh, it's about taking those concepts and turning them into action. So yeah, it's great. You gave yourself 
that chance to revisit it and do the exercises. Uh, yeah, it really is about doing. Joanne, hello. Thanks for joining us. Frog Dancer, he said, not sure, but I think you mentioned something about writing a book. How's that going? Or do you plan to write another book, mental fitness or otherwise? Absolutely. Uh, actually, I really like uh, visiting Japan. I, I take a lot of photos uh, in bookstores and um, because there's a lot of there's a lot of inter like books are often a very different format here. It's common to see much smaller books, um, and sometimes they're square. Uh, and so, like you might see a book that big because it's like really easy to read on the subway or something like that. Um, and the book designs also uh, are are quite beautiful. Um, so I was in I've been in some interesting bookstores uh, while I've been here, and I will do some more books. I've been writing a novel, and so I'm gonna make some time coming up in December to try to finish that up. Uh, and that's a, yeah, like a young adult novel. I'd love to turn that into a series, so we'll see. We'll try to finish it up, and then we'll see how that goes. But then absolutely, uh, there'll be, yeah, probably some opportunities to make some other kind of nonfiction, mental fitnessy, meditation type books and things like that. Mike. He said, I realized that me trying to escape OCD was also a compulsion. I also saw that any action to escape or avoid a feeling I don't like is a compulsion. Yeah, so useful to see, Mike. Yeah. One of the steps always, even though we begin quite often by cutting out a lot of compulsions, um, and they might be big changes, like compulsions we've done our entire lives, although that's often going to be the start, on this journey, at some point, it's going to be really useful to make compulsions okay. Paradoxically, that helps with dropping them, where it becomes no longer about, oh, I've got to get rid of this thing. But like, oh yeah, they're, they're, like I could do that, but I'd rather do this thing over here. There's something else I'd rather do. I'm going to give my time and energy to that. And it's not because I have to hate on this or judge myself for doing some compulsion. It's just because there's a, a thing that's better that I want to do. And we really switch to that approach. Delociraptor. Oh, Delociraptor, that's very kind of you. Delociraptor, I appreciate the donation. And you're actually giving a shout out to the book. Thank you. Thanks for, you know, thanks for sharing you know, metaphors and questions today and joining us and the donation. Yeah, Fabio said, what kind of novel? So the novel is about a girl in space who is afraid of everything. And she's on a ship with like the last of humanity. And so of course she had, when she has intrusive thoughts about like causing terrible things to happen uh, and like wiping out all of humanity, uh, that could actually happen. Uh, and so, yeah, it's about um, a journey that she has to go on. Um, to, uh, to uh, yeah, maybe, maybe save some people. Um, and she'll have to, yeah, overcome having terrible, horrible, intrusive thoughts about everything uh, in order to do that. Rachel, yeah, I said I'm recovering from surgery and I'm finding myself checking a lot, checking my temperature and incision points for infection and checking mentally what the probability of things going wrong in the future would be. Can you provide some direction for me to not do these compulsions and stay in the moment? Well, in some physical pain. Thank you. Yeah, so there's a couple things. Rachel, so one, like, giving kindness to yourself and care. Like, yeah, you just had surgery, so I hope you know, you're recovering well. Well, so yeah, like you mentioned there, there's going to be some pain, I hope. Uh, you're having an easy journey with the pain. And so it's really normal when we've had something difficult happen, we've had something painful happen, and there's ongoing pain, that we look for something to control. So seeing like the brain is just going to be going, ah, there's pain here. Come on, we got to check something. We got to do something. Uh, and so that's an opportunity to give it a hug. We can notice those moments 
Uh, you just want me to check this brain because you're just looking for something to feel some control right now. And so being able to give it a hug, and see like, oh, I, we don't have to check that, but I understand, right? Understanding with compassion to yourself why it wants to do that. Uh, with so many different health issues, uh, our, our brains will often react by just trying to find something to control. Uh, because yeah, there's so much about health we don't control. Uh, if there are uh, self-care, like aftercare practices you need to do, so if like checking your temperature and things like that is something that you know your doctor told you to do, uh, finding some times when you're going to do that, and so setting a schedule for it rather than waiting for some kind of uncertainty to pop up, be like, ooh, ooh, do I feel? Do I feel okay right now? Or maybe I should go check my temperature. So just making it something that is on your schedule that you decide versus getting pushed around by the brain is really useful. Uh, yeah, because we don't want to turn the surgery recovery time into just a lot of compulsion practice time because then it'll want to keep doing that uh, long after uh, there's no surgery to recover from. Yes, Erica, does any advice on how to use social media in a values-oriented way? And one, not get swept away and spend hours on it, and two, not fall into comparison, FOMO, envy about what other people are doing. Yes, so there's the, the way I approach it, and so I always share this with people, but I also do this myself, uh, is to pick one overarching big value. So like. Why am I using social media at all? Uh, so for instance, to share uh, mental health tools to help people on their adventures. Uh, and then you pick three uh, actions that lead to that overarching value. Um, so if someone's doing like sharing tools to help people on their mental health journeys, um, I might do uh, let's see, like one might be uh, sharing personal experiences of recovery. Uh, two might be uh, translating new research on mental health and neuroscience and brain stuff and things like that. Um, and three might be like making a cartoon uh, each week on uh, a mental fitness skill. And then, because Social media is about giving, so I don't need to be on there if I'm not giving something. And so if I'm on there, then it's I'm creating one of those three things. And it's setting up a framework like that, because then if we're not doing one of those three actions that we identified as one of the actions we do on social media, then uh, we don't need to be there. When we can practice giving that thing we want to give, and then you put down the phone, and then you walk away. And so setting up some simple exercises to practice doing that can be really fun. But that's how we make it, because by doing that, we also give ourselves a way to see that we've done enough, to see that we've done the successful action, so we can put it down. Because if it, if it just stopped at the first one, like, oh, uh, supporting people with mental health, then it's very difficult to walk away because you could always be doing more. So the, the three actions that lead up to the overarching value are our way to say, I've done the thing, I'm stepping away. And then we put it down. And we don't have to go back and check uh, because the goal was to give it. So there's no reason to go back and check that somebody like it, how much engagement did it get, anything like that. Irrelevant. We were successful the moment we shared it. And it doesn't need to be uh, it doesn't need to be something professional. It could be personal stuff. You can use the exact same approach with personal stuff. If somebody's overarching goal is just, I support my friends. What are three ways that you're going to support your friends? Uh, and so you might do something like saying, uh, you know, one of your actions might be, I leave three comments every day on friends' posts. So it doesn't, doesn't matter. Like you just you say, okay, I'm gonna go on, I'm gonna do the thing right now where I leave uh, supportive comments on friends' posts. 
You find three friends, leave three comments, walk away. Enjoy. Mm, KCP says too there's a timer on threads and Instagram. <laughs> but Erica says I would just slap the OK button and keep doing it. Mike, he said, ultimately, I've come to see that my brain is a story making machine and it creates these stories to explain the world around me. And if I believe these stories, then I can get caught in that story. Totally. Yeah, it's good. It is just trying to understand the world. Uh, but yeah, if you get caught up in the stories, especially the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves, mm, it can create a lot of issues. Shez, he said, what are your tips for disassociative feelings, sort of like constantly seeing you in third person, asking for a friend, obviously. Uh, so I have a video on it. Um, so if the, the video on depersonalized, depersonalization and derealization applies the same to dissociation. I'm starting to notice those are compulsions. Like before you even get to the dissociative feeling, there is the checking. Uh, and even separate from that, there's probably a lot of other areas in life where you're checking for a right feeling. I mean like, oh, I've just got to get this right. So if we're constantly teaching our brains like we've got to get a right feeling, uh, then it's going to apply that to us. And of course the feeling is going to be wrong, just like if we're trying to get a clean feeling, we feel contaminated. And so it's, it's approaching it just like a contamination feeling. So wanting to have the feeling, but then looking at all of the compulsions that are creating it. And you can cut those out. Oh, Rachel, uh, I hope the recovery goes well. Uh, Mike, yeah, you just got, I said, I've started to think of thoughts like smells. There are smells that I like and smells that I dislike, but given time, they will dissipate without me doing anything. Exactly. It's really useful to see that we experience thoughts just like we experience so many other things. Uh, yeah, you can see them as smells. You can see them as sounds. Uh, yeah, physical sensations too. But then that's why it's people will often notice as they cut out compulsions the brain will switch to something like physical sensations. Because, yeah, it never cared about the topic. It never cared about which experience. It's just looking for whichever experience you're going to judge as a wrong thing that shouldn't be there and then do compulsions to fix. Yeah, mud. Yeah, so you said, so do you not scroll full stop and only respond to direct messages or tags? So I, if I'm scrolling, like I'll scroll if there's like a reason. So I will do the thing where um, I'll find friends posts to like and comment on. Uh, so that's one of the actions I'll do. So I'll scroll through because um, it'll give me a bunch of people I don't know uh, potentially. Um, so I'll, like I'll scroll to find uh, a friend's post or something like that to like and leave a comment. Uh, but yeah, generally... Uh, I post and then uh, go to yeah the DMs like there'll be there'll be questions like especially the I've really been enjoying there's a so everybody knows there's an Instagram subscriber channel that I've started up and so I post there uh, usually daily sometimes multiple times a day uh, and then there's sometimes where I don't post because I'll be traveling or something like that but there I post. It's been great because everybody who's there wants to like work on things and explore concepts so more deeply. So the posts aren't, uh, I would say like the posts go more in depth. They aren't just kind of like a thing to share as an image. They're like, hey, we're, this is a resource and you want to understand this resource and like dig into it. Uh, and so often there's a lot of then discussion through DMs, um, people asking questions and things like that. So I am lucky in that if I go on social media, there's very likely uh, a, a discussion or there's a question from uh, you know uh, a client or a subscriber uh, there in the DMs. So also there's not uh, like there's not some great pull to go scrolling. 
because there's guaranteed there's somebody uh, I'd rather connect with in, in the messages. Bagel, bagel, bagel. Said, I love advocacy in Insta comments. I can hone in on a conversation with specific strangers. Recently, I've commented how neutralizing a suicidal thoughts is a compulsion that feeds more struggle. Yeah, and so like, there's a lot that we can explore on social media around, yeah, giving support uh, with mental health adventures. Uh, yeah, that makes it more fulfilling. Oh, Mike, yeah, exploring, explaining more about the thoughts. He said, I can even be in a very smelly place and choose not to engage my smelling organ, my nose, and analogously, I can be having troubling thoughts and choose not to engage my thinking organ, my brain. Yeah, well, it could be fun to even see the brain as this like, thought-smelling organ. And yeah, we're constantly like <laughs> trying to smell for a bad thought. We're going to be like, ah, we don't have to do that. Stay W. Steve. Yeah, said, okay, thank you. Just got it. The mere thought and or belief that recovery is necessary, that the quest to be recovered or healed brings about more struggles in that realm. Our brains are lovely, but also funny. Absolutely. Oh, Fabio, you're letting, you're letting brain, brain stuff get in the way of writing. Yeah, it can be fun to just explore writing, like, on, on its own. Like, it doesn't have to be uh, a thing that's going to turn into a novel. Uh, like, if you want to start writing a historical story, uh, you can start writing that, rather than judging it before you've written it. Because uh, then, of course, the brain's always going to say, oh, you're not ready, you don't know enough, etc. Uh, but yeah, the way to see that is to write the story, and then see what you want to add to it and even then write the story and give it to somebody else ask them what they want to see added to it because our brains always come up with problems <laughs> like that's a great analogy yeah, you said, but if i find a particularly bad smell and now i have to start bringing febreze or nose plugs or maybe not even going to certain places my life becomes limited yeah, if we're avoiding places in life because we're afraid of the, the smelly thoughts that'll come up there, it's super limiting. Yeah, Chiz, you said, lately I've discovered how much shame actually controls our actions, even in things we wouldn't think about, totally. Shame is, is one of those emotions, just like anxiety. Uh, the emotion, somebody might avoid something because of anxiety, somebody else might avoid something because of shame. Whatever that feeling is where we go, oh, like, this is a bad thing, I shouldn't do this, I need to get away, I need to control this, that uh, is going to be a useful feeling to touch and explore. Mm, but as Erica asks, does shame control our actions? Because we can definitely do things and feel shame and carry that along with us. Fragmented. He said, I don't know how to want to have that feeling or how to welcome it. I know the solution is acceptance and being unreasonable, but, it hard, but it's hard when it seems so important and somehow, oh, reflects on me. So I'd go after that somehow reflects on me part uh, because the way you described it right there uh, sounds passive and like it, it's reflecting on you. But is it possible that you attaching meaning to it and seeing it as reflecting on you when it's, it's just there? It's not, it's not doing anything. It's not reflecting anywhere.
Everyone, we'll wrap up soon. We'll wrap up. We're almost coming up on an hour and 30 minutes, so we'll, we'll wrap things up at the 30 minute mark. Angela, yeah, you said how actions and values are different, especially when we can value a certain action itself. Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't see them as different. In fact, it's really useful as you're exploring values uh, to articulate them as specific actions. I would say, and uh, people can run into challenges if they just approach values as kind of vague, like concepts, because uh, then we we don't know what the action is, and then so usually we don't practice the value. Whereas you know, I find I found it really helpful to make values concrete, specific actions. So I can say, oh, like I do this, uh, and then it's very clear what I'm gonna do. Yeah, it's just, well, I mean, taking actions based on shame. But the problem is that these actions are quite often quite automatic, almost like a reflex. Hmm? At first, because uh, we've come to see shame as this like a very bad thing and it means things and we must take action on it. Uh, and so that's why starting to explore sitting with it, and just noticing it, being curious about it, being curious about where it comes from. Like what? Are, what are the judgments I'm attaching to this that I then that are generating the shame? So what if I didn't attach all those judgments? What are the unhelpful beliefs I have here that are conflicting with experience and then generating shame? Well, what if I had some more useful beliefs? Uh, and so as we start to explore that, then the reflex becomes less automatic. But then Mud says here, I don't think I've benefited from doing things and feeling shame and letting it be there. I just ended up pushing through and that somehow wasn't helpful. Jordan, I said good morning. Good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for dropping on by. I said, I hope you all have a great day. Keep lifting those heavy weights. Oh, thanks, Jordan. Thanks for sharing that. I hope you're enjoying easily uh lightly lifting heavy weights to start off the week too <laughs> mike said i've also done some thinking about how we ruminate as a practice and what we're doing when we do it i see rumination as mentally holding an object within your focus while attempting to solve it as you're exploring rumination. Let it be okay to not have to spend too much time in your head exploring it. Because yeah, we can, we can figure out all of this stuff, but we can also hang out outside of our heads. Oh, the Lost Raptor, thanks for a second donation. Oh, I really appreciate it. Sid here, brain tech support is absolutely awesome. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for putting in the time for this on a regular basis. I very much appreciate it. Oh, the last rep there. I appreciate you being here today and sharing with us. Yeah, I'm glad you could, uh, yeah, you could connect with brain tech support live and the community here and that it's been useful to you. So yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you to everybody uh, stopping on by uh yeah it's really great that you know even even as uh we move about the world there are different things happening in our lives we can get together and talk about the stuff that's happening up here and we talk about it with a you know a kind of a consistent framework i really appreciate uh you know so many of you who you know, return uh, each time we do Brain Tech Support Live, because uh, that really, you can see how that really creates a community and a language that we then have for talking about these experiences um, and for kind of continuing a discussion, let's say with like elements of consistency and these touch points that we're familiar with. So yeah, thank you everybody for, for being here today and sharing uh, from your experiences. Oh, Steve, thank you to you as well. 
Uh, and so with that, everybody, yeah, we'll wrap things up. I hope you have a good start to the week. There will be experiences this week. Again, their life goes with the having experiences. Uh, yeah, whatever feelings come up around those, like we were just talking about there around shame, but could be anything. Just taking a moment to be curious about where that comes from. Being like, what am I trying to get right now? And what if I just slow down here a bit for a moment? Um, and consider what I'd like to give, whether that's giving something to myself, to some experience, some smell in the head, uh, or ourselves, or other people. Yeah, Jerome, SW, Sarah, hey, KCP, thank you so much. Oh, Mike, thank you for the donation. Oh, Mike, thank you for the kind comment. He said here, uh, Mark, you helped me save my life. I'm so appreciative. Uh, thank you deeply. Your videos and books are an incredible resource. Oh, Mike, I, I really appreciate it. Uh, yeah, it's, yeah, it really is a, a huge honor to get to join you all on your journeys. Uh, yeah, just kind of navigating life and navigating having a brain. But yeah, it's I find it's really special uh, to me to get to uh, share uh, kind of skills and experiences from my own adventure with other people. Um, so yeah, thank you. I'm really glad these tools have yeah, been useful to you. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Joshi, are you here? Thanks for dropping by. Frogman said, that's very kind of you. All right, everybody, thank you so much. Have a great start to the week. Doing the things. Making the choices in each moment. I'll talk to you soon.